Super. So, welcome uh, today to our interview. Uh, we have Flo today from Hub Hoi An, which is a upcoming co-living and uh, co-working space in Vietnam. It may be known to some of you watching this video because it's um, existing as a co-working space since a few years, but now Flo is putting Vietnam on the map for nomads because there was no co-living space uh, yet in this beautiful country, which is crazy. So Flo, welcome. Introduce yourself uh, shortly. Who are you uh, and why are you now suddenly opening a co-living space in Vietnam? Well, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, I'm excited to have this chat with you. Uh, I know you do really cool stuff in co-living and for the co-living community. So uh, excited to to share our story with you. Um, yeah, myself, I, um, I'm i interested in many things. I, uh, I have a former life in development aid and have a former life in tech. Uh, ran a little IT agency doing mobile and web applications. Um, and then uh, I was a customer of Hapoyan myself. Um, I was actually in Da Nang, so also central Vietnam, very, very nearby. And I didn't find my community and I didn't find a co-working space that's really targeted for nomads, really understands nomads. And so I tried out Hoi An, which I knew had Hap Hoi An. Um, I gave it like two or three days. Uh, after the first day, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm moving to Hoi An. So that's how my Vietnam stay started in 2020. It was supposed to be three or four months. And then uh, obviously in 2020, uh, COVID happened. Um, and so it was a great place to stay here in Hoi An in that time. And eventually the old owner who had done an amazing job, um, she was like, I'm done with the hub. Uh, I'm done. Uh, I'm ready to move on. Uh, and I was, uh, I loved the hub. So, so I bought it from her. Um, and since then we've, we've rebuilt it. Um, we've rebuilt it in a new location that's right in the middle of the rice fields. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we did a did a decent job at maintaining the same kind of community because the hub has always drawn really cool nomads in Southeast Asia. Um, not just your average nomad. Nomads are already cool, okay? But now take like a group of people that are, you know, maybe more in like their early mid-30s as opposed to early mid-20s. Um, you know, a higher share of entrepreneurs, higher share of freelancers who really have already seen a lot. Um, so we still draw that kind of crowd, which is awesome. Uh, and now have like a slightly elevated co-working experience. Um, so yeah, Hub was started in 2017 by Sarah, and then I've uh, I've uh, taken it over. I, I took it over and I rebuilt it now in the last few years. Uh, and uh, yeah, we just launched our co-living space. So um, we uh, it's it's kind of like to you, you probably would have started as a co-living space, not as a co-working space. And if I started over, I might do the same, honestly. Um, so ever since uh, operating the hub, people have been asking us for rooms. Um, and we used to organize that more on a one-by-one -one basis with some partner hotels, but those weren't true co-living spaces, right? So we got that feedback, but also we wanted to have our own space that really um, we can, um, yeah, redevelop. You know, we, we don't have a lobby. We have a social area, right? Like it's, it's meant for hanging out. It's not meant for... Um, it's not meant to be just a stay lobby. So there's things we've rearranged in that space. And um, yeah, we're really fortunate also to have found this this uh, the space, uh, not just the space, but also the people who run it. Um, uh, they're, they're essentially our partner company. So this is a joint venture. I think in terms of the real contact that people will have and things that matter, community management, member selection, that's all done by the hub, of course. Um, so I think the experience is really a hub experience, but it's good to have an accommodation partner. Um, so and always good to work with the local community as well. Uh, so um, always better to kind of just doing your own thing. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's got eleven rooms. Two of those are dorms. Um, so we uh, we've heard mixed messages about dorms uh, in terms of the kind of people it attracts. Uh, I think dorms always attract a lot of great people. And then it might also attract a few people that are maybe like a little bit louder or whatever, where we are going to do a selection there. And we are going to see who fits in. But what I've, what I've witnessed in other co-living spaces in Chiang Mai is that some of those that have a dorm have a very strong community because the people who are in the dorm together, 
they're you know it's it's a it's a it's an intimate experience in a way right so and people also are just exposed to each other much more so if one person goes for dinner it's much more likely for the others to join and then i think that's going to ripple down into the rest of the co-living and then of course also the co-working community so co-living always also means co-working those two are, are always in a bundle um so they're always going to be part of the larger Hawaiian uh, community um, not vice versa, of course, so you can just become a member of the co-working space as well, get a lot of the community benefits. Uh, we do a lot of events. Yeah. Sorry, I feel like I could just keep on going. Is that is that a good uh, introduction to leave something fundamental out or where do you want to take this? Definitely. I mean, what is always a really important question for the tenants uh, is who are the other people in the hub? And now you already briefly mentioned um, you are aiming to attract people in their mid thirties, uh, more like entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, maybe you can go a little bit more into the detail. What kind of community are you planning to build? What are the core values, uh, so to say? Yeah, um, great question. So I do want to be very open to to different groups of people and honestly that's that's actually a high value for us so um the co-working space always has been very gender balanced and um, also quite balanced in terms of profession so of course we also get a lot of techies and i'm a techie so i'm allowed to say this it's nice if it's not 80 percent techies you know i think we're more at 50 or 60 percent and um, the rest we have a lot of writers academics we have you know PhD uh, people, designers. Um, so that's in terms of profession, but also, the, of course, it has an impact on the gender balance. Uh, so we've always been around 50-50, which also is rare for a co-working space. And that's also what I'm aiming for, for the co-living. Um, and then, yeah, diversity across age as well is important to us. Um, both younger and older, um, I want to be fine. So I might not approve people because of I don't think they're mature enough. I don't want to use age as like a very superficial metric. Like I think we've all met people that are freaking awesome that happen to be a little bit younger or a little bit older for that matter, right? Um, but I think the average is in the 30s. Um, yeah, I would say really the, the party is diversity. The party is people who want to be part of a community, uh, who are going to be active community participants. Um, of course, we create a lot of uh, member events. Um, but it's only going to work if people actually join, if people sometimes also take charge and be like, let's do this, let's do that. Um, uh, yeah, so that kind of person uh, is, is welcome with us. Besides that, I don't, I don't want to put up too many limitations. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about activities. So how does a normal day look like in Hoi An? I think you are not really in the city center because you are surrounded by rice fields uh, with an open view so this is also something pretty nice you know if you need to think a little bit more in a visionary sense it's nice to have a, a wide open uh, view so what are the activities people can do when they finish their work day like how does life in Hoi An feel like yeah yeah great question so um the location is uh, in the rice fields but Hoi An is so small that it kind of feels pretty central anyway. How um, many so people are there? So that people get in... Um, uh, at the co-working space or in Hoi An? No, like uh, inhabitants in, in the city. Like how big is the city? Yeah. I think I read 120,000 the other day. But if you take into account like the surrounding area, it's probably more. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's not a very big city. Um, it feels very natural and it has these, so it actually has rice fields that are kind of in between population centers. Um, so it's not it's not like Chiang Mai where you just have to drive for a while until you actually hit the rice fields and that's really at the outskirt of the city. It's more, so it has kind of like the center, of course there's some rice fields there, then has the beach area and we are kind of in between those two. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about five minutes to the beach, five minutes to the to the old town. Um, in terms of a day at the hub, um, we um, so I would start with uh, Monday is kind of a special day. So today, for example, we have a family meeting um, every day at 6 p.m. That's for introductions, new people to say hi, introduce themselves. And then we collect feedback, anything that you know is maybe bothering people or wishes 
Uh, so we really try to be responsive to that. And then the important round is activity planning. Uh, and so that that influences the rest of the week. So people um, people can suggest things, uh, you know, things they want to do. We have a lot of board games. Sometimes somebody requests that or uh, maybe, you know, go snorkeling on Jim Island or go to waterfalls, um, uh, all these kind of things. And then people can join those activities. So a lot of our activities are member led. Um, then the, the second event that we always lead is Friday evenings, um, we do sunset drinks. So um, we kind of have a West orientation. So uh, beyond the rice fields, there's a sunset, which is really nice. And we yeah just kind of like get the weekend started uh, socially. Um, yeah, usually we have like five to eight events like that. Um, we do a lot of ice bathing, usually twice a week. Uh, yeah, and then everything else is every now and then. Um, uh, every day at 1 p.m. we have community lunch. So actually you can, uh, um, when I was a member, I used to love this because even when I was at my busiest and wouldn't take time off for social events, I was like, well, you got to eat, right? So um, there will be always at least that part of the day that you uh, get to chat with people if you're a workaholic like me, um, which ideally you attend more member events. Um, but that's up to you, of course. Mm -hmm. And we try to eat uh, healthy food. We cook like poke bowls, Buddha bowls, kind of stuff you can eat on a daily basis and feel feel nourished. Yeah. So how much money do you need approximately in a month in, in uh, Hoi An to live a uh, normal, comfortable life? Let's say eat out once a day. And uh, yeah, just like an average so people get an idea. Great question. Um... If you're on a budget, uh, six, 700 euro. Um, if you want to be a little bit more comfortable, like you describe, maybe more eight, 900, maybe 1200, kind of that range, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And how long can you stay as a, a foreign remote worker in Vietnam? I don't think there is a digital nomad visa yet, if, if I'm correct, but how long can you stay in Vietnam? And is there a way to stay there longer if you really fall in love with that country? Yeah, absolutely. So it actually just got a whole lot better in Vietnam, which we're all really excited about. Um, uh, they recently introduced a three months visa or brought it back, I suppose. Um, I think many people don't know that yet. So it's also still quite empty here. It's, it's, it's fascinating going to Chiang Mai, going to Bali, and even Berlin, seeing how busy it is with people. People haven't really discovered Vietnam yet, so inflation hasn't really arrived. It's still more quiet than before COVID. But also, they just changed the visa. So this is a new thing. I think, like, word has to get around. Um, yeah, so you can apply for it online. It's called the e-visa, 90 days. Uh, and 90 days just cost $25 for a single entry. Uh, and you can get multi-entry multi, multi -entry as well for $50. So... Uh, I think it's really great. Um, we think you can just renew it, but it might be necessary to do a quick border run, um, which here, you know, like Vietnam is a very slim country, just kind of like go west, uh, and it's about half a day in the bus uh, going to uh, the, I think, low ocean border, border and back. Um, so relatively easy to really stay here for a long time as well, since at three months visas, um, uh, border run is quite doable in that time frame. Um, but we're hoping you can renew them. I think that was the case with previous e visas. Yeah, uh, it's still very new, so uh, we're we're gonna see. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah. So you have an open playing field. Uh, everything is starting now. More remote workers will discover Vietnam, and then the word will spread definitely. And you are the pioneer. So <laughs> this is awesome. No way, yeah. And what I mean, what we saw here in Malta when we opened our co-living and there was also a co-working space of course inside is that locals came and they just wanted to uh, yeah go there for co-working and then basically the magic happened and locals and incoming remote workers they started to mingle and building connections is this something do you see happening already in hoi an or is there those are still two separate worlds yeah, I would say they're still a little bit separate. Um, we do encourage Vietnamese people to join us as well. We actually give them a discount because we want that intermingling to happen. 
Um, I think a lot of the Vietnamese people that join us actually come from the big cities and they will often have a job in the big cities in Saigon and Hanoi. And um, yeah, so they're quite exposed. Um, uh, but they tend to uh, intermingle a little bit less. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that I actually don't permit teams to join the co-working space. So in terms of your business, that's not the best decision ever. It's always great to be selling to companies as opposed to individuals. But we don't permit whole companies because we're all about that community. So also the Vietnamese people who join us are freelancers. Um, they all speak English. Um, and they uh, there's the conditions to 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 be there because if you have like a, a team that's like a clique right they want to hang out with each other and i only want to have people who want to hang out with other people so yeah. this makes sense and what is like of course prices may change due to inflation and uh, seasonality but what is the cheapest uh, price if you decide to stay in a dorm in the moment so what is the yeah, price range um, of your co-living so prices are going to go up soon, uh, but for now, to be in the dorm only costs three hundred fifty dollars, um, and that includes the co-working space membership. Uh, and it goes a little bit down if you stay three months or longer. Um, that's the dorm. The rooms start from six hundred fifty dollars. Um, both of those include uh, airport pickups, so we'll pick you up from the airport. Um, all the community events and yeah, the co-working space membership, which is uh, it's about nine hundred meters away. Or 0 0.55 miles. Um, yeah, so it goes all through the rice fields. So so that's nice. And then the co-working space itself is 155 euro, um, which I think is $65, something like that. Um, yeah, 4 million dong. <laughs> if you calculate in dong, Daniel, I don't know. Uh, um, probably euro, yeah. <laughs> But yeah. is there an airport right in Hoi An, or how can you travel to your space? Yeah, so the local airport is in Da Nang. Uh, da Nang is just 30 minutes away. Um, it somehow feels much further away, but it's actually just 30 minutes. So, um, yeah, pretty close. Wow. Um, in between, we will also show some pictures and videos of uh, the space. So. Besides that, which other um, features can people expect in the space? What is, for example, the internet speed? This is always, of course, a really basic question. But what about the internet speed? Uh, and what about the reliability? Because some nomads, they need to be online all the time. And then, of course, they want to know before. Do you have backup power generators? Do you have uh, like a backup internet? Just tell us about uh, this a little bit. Yeah, yeah, great question. Internet is super important, obviously. Uh, I think it helps that I was a digital nomad before and have suffered from bad Wi-Fi myself. Uh, uh, yeah, we have business-grade uh, uh, internet. So both the, the, the DSL plan we have uh, is rock solid, and then we have um, enterprise-grade hardware for the Wi-Fi network uh, at the hub. Um, uh, it happens sometimes, like local provider outages are very rare. It happens sometimes that Vietnam as a whole uh, has worse connectivity because like underwater cables seem to be damaged. Um, and in those cases, our plan is actually still really good. So most of Vietnam will be offline will or like slow, I'd say, and we're still pretty, pretty decent. Um, the other thing that's great is that Vietnam has amazing 4G um, wire, like mobile internet. Um, it's really fast and it's really, really cheap. So that's also our backup solution. Um, we have uh, two Wi-Fi routers uh, that are uh, 4G routers. So um, many members also have like a really strong data plan. Uh, so uh, yeah, the combination always keeps us online. Okay. And is there a need for a VPN? Because some people also, um, in some countries, they need to use VPN because internet is kind of a little bit restricted. Is this an issue in Vietnam or no? Mostly it's not. Um, there are a few restricted websites, but it's just a handful. Um, so that'll happen very rarely that you really need one. You do need a VPN if you want to use ChatGPT. So that's something to keep in mind. Vietnam is one of the few countries where you need to have a VPN. So that's the main reason why I have a VPN. Okay, got it. And what do you... What do you envision for the next, let's say, three years or four or five years uh, 
for your space. Do you want to keep it that small or do you even see this turning into a digital nomad village where people move there and they start to invest? I think it's a little bit not that easy to invest in Vietnam as a foreigner. Um, but do you have those plans or do you just want to keep it low key, so to say? Yeah, great question. So um, let's see how Hoi An develops. Uh, it's been a little bit quiet since COVID uh, and uh, we really have to see if it takes off. Many people think it's going to get crowded again next year or at least more full than the last years. Um, so I think it's slowly going to get better. Um, and then I would love to add another co-living space. So right now we just have 11 rooms. Uh, if things go well, they're going to fill up pretty pretty soon and you'll have to book in advance. So that's uh, that's my hope. And then, of course, I also want to add a second co-living space. Uh, I think the center is always going to be the co-working. That's where we do our events. Uh, that's, that's kind of where our original strength lies. But when we do co-living, I also want to get that right. So make sure the community part and all these things are met. Um, so I think there will be like one small expansion. Then we are looking at some other places in Southeast Asia. There are some really dreamy places uh, in Southeast Asia that don't have a good co-working experience yet. Um, I actually don't, also don't like the co-working experience in the big cities, including Da Nang, but um, our, I feel like our specialty is going to a place that has no co-working at all. Um, and that's what we've done so far. Um, and kind of like getting something going. Um, uh, so we put Hoi An on the map for digital nomading. And uh, there are a few places where we could do that as well. So that's what I'm tempted by. Yeah, one or two places in uh, Vietnam and other countries as well. Myanmar might make sense. They are still opening up. And I think there's no co-working space in the whole country existing. Um, I think it's a great time to open a space in Myanmar right now. Yeah. I've been there. Uh, they didn't even have any ATMs in the country. There was one internet connection in one coffee shop, which crazy. Anyway, everything is changing. So this is really uh, positive, especially that people can go to Asia and experience, you know, growth and uh, positivity. I think we will see a lot of people from Europe also relocating maybe permanently or temporarily to Southeast Asia. So this is this is nice. Yeah. And yeah, there are many people who once they discover once they discover Hoi An, they they want to come back. So uh, for most, it's not on the radar. But then when they come, they're like, oh, oh, right, cool. So like this year, we had somebody who came back for the third time. Many people came back for a second time, like changing their plans, also to spend more time here. So I'm hopeful once the word gets around and people like discover this place, it's uh, yeah, especially in comparison to Bali, which is like the opposite right now. It's like full, it's, like the roads are full. It's expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, speaking about me and new places to set up shop. Um, now, internet here is is pretty decent, but wherever Starlink gets started is a is a great place to to build a co-working space. Now, I think so. For example, the Philippines Starlink is now um, active there. Uh, you can get Starlink in the Philippines, and the Philippines is known to be drop dead gorgeous in terms of landscape and not have great internet. And that's very different with Vietnam. Like all of Vietnam has great internet uh, most of the time. Um, so the Philippines, for example, also like if you say Myanmar, uh, maybe there's great places that don't have internet co connectivity. Once uh, things stabilize in, in Myanmar, and hopefully democracy comes back, um, you know, uh, there'll be a good place to to invest in as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, starting to me makes it super exciting. Somehow it opens up the playing field, you know. Um, with solar panels as well, you could like you could start a co-working space wherever you want. Now it could be in the middle of like the jungle or something. That's true. And also like one topic which is always being discussed now, we have so many spaces opening up all around the world. You want to open multiple ones. Uh, it feels like every two days there is a new co-living space being opened and everyone is kind of sitting on the same problem that you don't own that space. Um, in the end, most of them, they are just paying rent, not only you as a co-living operator, as the community leader, but also the tenants which in the long run is somehow not fair. Um, it would be smarter to collectively uh, start to own properties all around the world. What are you, of course, this is super futuristic, but what are your thoughts on this, that you kind of crowdfund, let's say now, that first co-working space in, in Myanmar, and it becomes really a community project? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know Myanmar well as a market. It seems to me like there's a civil war there right now. So it's, uh, I wasn't being totally serious about going to Myanmar next. Um, but in principle, this idea of co-owning, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and even um, as a mode of, of running a small business, like a co-working space, uh, if it is owned, if the land is owned statistically, it's a lot more, it's economically a lot more uh, uh, successful and makes a lot more sense as opposed to renting somewhere, which is what I'm doing as well. So just like in, in, independent of the co-ownership part. Um, but then, yeah, the co-ownership co part makes so much sense because um, it kind of aligns the incentives in the right way because the people, the interesting thing with land is always the person who does the activity there creates the value and increases the value of the land, right? Um, but then actually harvesting that value is usually somebody else. So aligning those two, the early, the people who get the community started, right? The, the, the early adopters of the space, if you will, if they own a stake in the space, then they get rewarded for getting a space started, right? Um, because it really is the whole community um, that does that. Now, interestingly, I actually grew up in a co-owned co-living space, which uh, back back when when I uh, when I was a kid, that was called a commune, right? Uh, a co-owned co-living space um, uh, or an intentional community. Um, and yeah, so my parents kind of got that started, and then they got like a group of of other people to join them. Um, it was always uh, there was never like leadership, um, but everything was voted on. Uh, and then they were just working groups making decisions. Um, I prefer a slightly more centralized model. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't have to be a benevolent dictatorship, like which is what a business is, right? Uh, could still be with votes, but I think some sort of leadership is still really useful. Um, uh, so I, I would probably set it up a little bit differently. Um, and in a way, that's what I'm doing with my co-living space. But I know that co-owning property and living on it together is very feasible. And it's also very economical, by the way. Like you garner the social benefits of living with a tribe, um, all of the you know all the benefits. Like I, I think a human needs it as well. Like we need to have a community, um, but then also just economically, it just makes much more sense to share resources, right? Definitely, and we need technology uh, for this. I think, and this technology in a moment is being developed. So I'm speaking to others in Portugal, the open. Um, sustainable farms actually and starting to build houses there and they use like uh, crypto tokens for the ownership and also like um, to rent it out and generate passive income so on and so forth so everything is happening um, we need to have the technology in order to have um, a leverage so this is happening um, it's no longer just like a hippie movement of people who used to live in communes, you know, we talk about those ideas. It's really happening. So this is uh, wonderful. If you could dream, what kind of help would you like to receive? Maybe from Vietnam, from the government, or let's say from the local government in Hoi An. Do they already have an interest to attract those people? Is this already a topic? Um, or is it still too uh, too early? Because here in Malta, it's a topic. We just had a national workshop on digital nomadism and remote work. And of course, they understood that this is the future and they are really interested in what we are doing. Is this already happening in Vietnam? Um, that's not happening in Vietnam. Um, uh, now... I think like the whole situation in Malta is also because you've done amazing public um, outreach and you have um, you know done done a great job getting that local community engaged and helping them understand uh, what this really means for them. Um, that's something I haven't found the time for yet. Um, where I'm currently at is I'd like to find other kind of digital nomad community leaders in Vietnam to team up with. Uh, and that's honestly difficult because as far as I know, there, there's no other co-working space that's really focused on digital nomads. Um, and uh, similar with co-living, I would say, although I'm not totally sure about Hanoi and Saigon, but in terms of co-working, yeah, it's kind of missing even the big cities. So I feel like digital nomads are really, except for the hub, are kind of like a side, a side note for a lot of the businesses. Um, even though in terms of like, if you really pay attention, they're super important for communities here. And honestly, I think that would just be the first step. If the, if the Vietnamese government could understand 
what a digital nomad is and why a digital nomad is not a backpacker, that would be a first great step. And I feel like then we'd get a lot more attention. But for example, the fact that they have removed the three months visa for so long until recently um, shows that they maybe don't fully understand the positive impact of digital nomads. Um, I think in all of Southeast Asia, there has been a little bit of a push, a little bit against backpackers. Um, and it's actually, yeah, there's there's like this notion of backpackers that is very different from what I had. To me, it's just a, kind of like a, a traveler, usually, you know, quite relaxed and whatever. But I think here's been a little bit too many young, very young, very heavy on the party aspect of the trip, you know, kind of backpackers. And so that like then like your entrepreneur who maybe employs 20 people around the world uh, with his company and happens to want to live in Vietnam for a few months, um, they kind of like get thrown out with the bathwater there. Uh, so it's kind of like if they understood that, that would be a great first step. And then we could talk about maybe a, a digital nomad visa as well, um, if that's if that part becomes clear. Definitely. But, uh, yeah, really, it's such a low hanging fruit. I mean, like um, so many countries could, um, it's not just about attracting people. I mean, even if you have like offer like a smart tax regime, um, like if you, allow people to have their tax residency in your country for 1%, 2 or 3% maybe of their income without paperwork. Um, if, if like one or two countries got this right, they could make hundreds of millions, maybe billions with digital nomads setting up their residency for nothing, for, for pieces of paper, right? Um, now, this, this is a very different like proposition, but... I feel like the government that really gets it, that really understands the problems of digital nomads and offers something for them in terms of tax residency um, could really make bank. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be Vietnam, um, but it could be. So Vietnam sometimes will um, will surprise you with quite quite uh, um, forward-thinking policy. Um, and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, exclude that possibility for sure. Definitely. I mean, what I see is now... After this video, your whole space will be overrun by nomads and people will start talking, they come. Then you basically deliver, you have a lot of uh, people coming, maybe for a year. And then I think news, uh, television will come to you and do shoot videos. Definitely. I already see it, the field, you know, and just telling that story. Um, and then probably once you were shown in the main media, main news, in German or French television, then also the local government maybe in Vietnam will recognize your efforts, what you are doing. So it takes time. Mm -hmm. um, how can people reach out to you uh, the easiest? If they... Yeah. So our website, our website is hubhoyan.com, um, all in one word. Um, hub and then Hoyan H O I A N Hub Hoyan. Um, we're also with the same uh, username on Facebook, on Instagram, um, and uh, yeah, you can call us, you can message us. Uh, we love to to hear your questions. I hope we covered all of the important points. Are there some points open uh, from your side? Otherwise, I give you the last uh, words. <laughs> Maybe for overlaying the video, I could try and describe the two spaces a little bit more if you wanted to put that together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, should we try that? Yes, or you do it when you record the video because then you can really say what you see. Yeah, Maybe that's easier. No? That makes sense. That makes sense. Nice. Um, yeah. Final words. Can I still do final words? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your time. Um, looking forward to follow you, see you growing, putting Vietnam on the map. It will happen. And I think, yeah, soon we see this all over Vietnam, different co living communities popping up. Thank you, Flo. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks for spreading the word. Yeah. Thanks for putting the co-living community on the map worldwide, Daniel. Like, I highly, highly appreciate about what you do for our community. Uh, I'm grateful to be able to be a small part of it. 
And um, yeah, thanks for everybody uh, watching. I hope you spread the word about Vietnam. It's awesome, especially Hoi An. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you, Flo.